Kansas won again this weekend, struggled again this weekend, beat TCU 83-81. It was controversial. Let me set the scene for you, then we'll discuss it. So there's basically a minute left. TCU is up 79-77. Kansas has the ball. Kevin McCullough tries to feed Hunter Dickinson. Ernest Uday, a former Jayhawk, by the way, appears to get a steal. TCU is out in transition, five on four, because Hunter Dickinson is lying down on the court after being struck seemingly inadvertently by Uday in the head. Whistle blows, transition opportunity is over. Officials review it. They call it a flagrant one. So instead of TCU being five on a being on a five on four break with a two-point lead in the final minute, Kansas gets two free throws and the ball with 57 seconds remaining. Hunter Dickinson makes both free throws, tie game. Dewan Harris gets a bucket, KU up 81-79, 43 ticks left. On the other end, Micah Peavy, offensive rebound, put back, ties the score, 81. So now Kansas has the ball, tie game, shot clock off. Dewan Harris gets it to Hunter Dickinson, catches it deep, easy bucket, also controversial. Kansas has a lead. Jameer Nelson Jr. misses a jumper at the buzzer, and that was that. Dead leg, what'd you make of the final minute, Kansas TCU? Should TCU fans, I know they are upset, Mm -hmm. should they legitimately be upset? I mean, you are entitled to be upset if you're a TCU fan. I get it. Uh, I'm not up in arms over the call, to be honest. Uh, The irony with all this is that Uday, as you mentioned, former Kansas player, he is not at Kansas because Hunter Dickinson went to Kansas. Uh, So the fact that he winds up playing uh, a critical role, albeit arguably unintentional role with this, and uh, and enabling a, a window to be opened for Kansas to take the game, uh, to Big 12 fans that are familiar with this, this is obviously nothing new. I, I don't, I frankly, I don't hate the call. Um, it is a go either way, close to 50 51 for me. Um, I can easily understand if you're a TCU fan, plus you're in that, like you're in that building. TCU's had a decent start so far, but it doesn't have a resume win yet this season. Um, so you had one, uh, a really, you know, you were hanging around and hanging around and hanging around, and they couldn't. They couldn't pull it out despite playing them close there. Kansas has won. I mean, the amount of games that Kansas has won in the Big 12 at home, you know, where it's been down to a possession in the final minute, but they seem to pull it out, speaks to uh, the year-over-year reliability to Bill Self as a coach and that roster. People that don't like Kansas are obviously going to push back against that pretty hard and say, you know, it's always eight on five in that building. Uh, I get it. Uh, Kansas fans are at the very top of the list, and I say this endearingly and lovingly because I find it uh, – <laughs> I find it so entertaining. I don't think there is a fan base in America that is more offended by the nation, the notion of an official calling a foul on their home team than the Kansas fans. And that is, it is every home, every home arena is, it does this. There is no fan base that takes it more personally than KU. And uh, because of that, um, Kansas and that, that team, they, they, they rally around this and that building is among the very best, if not the best in the entire sport. I didn't have a huge issue with the call and that bucket that Dickinson hit to to win it uh that's you know on the very short list of reasons why kansas needed to get dickinson on its roster this season um was plays like that um and i don't know if you know i wasn't following along in real time with this on social media or anything like that i don't know if people thought maybe that dickinson might have even uh pushed up to get some space and there should have been a call there again um but you're in the fog what are you going to do tcu put up a big battle uh and a good fight but ku gets the win and has is is we'll see down the road on kansas and and if it's able to uh to establish itself as the true alpha in this league with Alexa Houston and all these others, GP, because um, I think even some KU fans would admit that to this point, it's getting the wins as it should, but there have been a couple of instances here where it is, uh, it has escaped and, you know, in close to 50, 50 kind of matchup. So that, that was kind of my takeaway on the game. Just to double down on something you said, I was down in Fort Lauderdale, CBS sports HQ studios. First time I've been down there in a while, by the way. Yeah. They're didn't, great. Didn't even recognize the building when you walked in kind of deal. That studio's great. Yeah, yeah. Green it's room's very great. similar to the Stamford one up here. Yeah, yeah. No, it looks sharp. I was, uh, I was real impressed. So it was nice to be down there, but I was uh, on set with uh, Jeremy St. Louis, and we, you know, we're coming right off of this game live. And uh, he was like, "Just your thoughts on the final minute." I said, "I feel like I've watched that final minute of a Kansas game inside Allen Fieldhouse a hundred times. Yeah, like tight game against an inferior opponent." controversial call but it goes your way then dewan harris makes a bucket game's over like you know they they just felt like i've watched that i know i haven't seen it a hundred times it felt like i'd seen it a hundred times um as for how it went down i'll just say this gene sterator is the cbs sports officiating expert right yeah he said it should not have been a flagrant immediately he looked at it they went to him he said i don't see it 
It should not. This is in the middle of the review. Yeah. Yeah. He's basically predicting they're going to look at this. They ain't going to see what they need to see. We're just going to, you know, we're just going to keep playing. So he was surprised that the officials actually did call it a flagrant one. Meantime, we go back to the studio in New York, CBS Broadcast Center, Jay Wright and Seth Davis. They both disagree with Gene and said it should have been a flagrant one. So for our purposes, I don't think I have much interest in like debating um, whether the call was technically correct or not relative to the rule book because if G I'll just it's simple yeah. if Gene and Jay and Seth can't agree I don't imagine there's much anything we're gonna be able to say there might not be hope for the world if that's the case I'm that's good I'm just saying th this seems like the type of thing where people have already made their minds up right and there ain't nothing I'm gonna be able to say change anybody like I could talk to Seth Davis about this for the next hour I would not change his mind all right. So I don't think we're changing anybody's mind. I guess the main thing I would say is that regardless of whether it was a correct call relative to the rule book or not, it felt wrong. It felt Emphasis wrong. on the word felt. Yeah. It felt wrong to have a game decided that way because it really did flip the game. Like if TC was up to and out in transition five on four break in the final minute, you just pause it right there and do the whole win probability thing. They're probably going to win that game. But by the time TCU got the ball back, TCU was down two and basically on the wrong side of a two-for-one situation because Kansas got to go down and take right. two-for-one. So that stinks. I hated the call, even if it was technically right, and I'm not certain that it was. Simply put, if a game can be determined with a flagrant one connected to what we all watched on Saturday afternoon, we have a rule book problem. What Ernest Uday did in that moment should not flip a game against TCU. That's the part that felt wrong. So if Gene Steratore is right and it should not have been a flagrant one relative to the rule book, then shame on the refs. But if Jay and Seth were right that it should have been a flagrant one relative to the rule book, then we need to change the rule book because I just sitting and I saw Kansas fans, even some of them, tweeting this on Saturday. I feel bad about that. Like, I'm glad we won. I'll take it. I'm trying to win another Big 12 title. But that didn't feel right. That didn't feel right to me. I don't care what the rule is. I mean, obviously, I do care what the rule is. But it's just when you watch that and you go, did that feel right? Should that really have decided that game? I didn't think so. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, there's a lot of gray area, in my opinion, when it comes to flagrant run interpretation. You get some of this as a... An analog is in uh, college football with the targeting rule, and that is, this has been something that has obviously caused plenty of uproar in that sport. Uh, hopefully it doesn't rear its head, uh, pun intended, there on Monday night in the national championship game. We'll pick that before the show is out here. Um, but, yeah, I would, you know, when it comes to the flow of the game, the way that it was playing out, uh, particularly with how Uday was playing and how that play played out. I wouldn't disagree with you on that, GP. You just don't want to have a game marred by that. Now, sometimes it's just inevitable. It's going to happen. Uh, but I, I wish there was a bit more decisiveness in the language uh, when it comes to some of these flagrant ones. I mean, I, I wrote about it last week in the court report. There are multiple flagrant one interpretations for coaches uh, being outside the coaching box. And it is a little bit of an irony. Um, and a couple of people found me and said that uh, they were I'm genuinely happy to, to hear this was the case. A uh, couple of officials were like keeping coaches in check and being like, get in the box. So it was kind of, it was cool to see that, that the article actually you know, seemed to have a little bit of impact there. But it is ironic that that kind of flagrant one warning, even warning first in a flagrant one has not been called for years and years and years. And yet a play like this can I don't want to say it flipped the game because there's no telling that TC would win the game if it doesn't get called. Um, you just don't want to see it happen there. So I don't I don't disagree with you on, on terms of uh, how it felt in the moment there. And the rule probably needs a little bit more clarity here. You get this every so often, every few times a season parish where you get a flagrant one. And when you watch the play, you just don't feel like the player was doing it uh, consciously or with enough intent to to raise it to that level. That That's exactly right. Like, and I, I know the rule about, you know, arm to head. I got you. Mm -hmm. I don't believe Ernest Uday did that on purpose. All right. I don't believe he tried to hit Hunter Dickinson. And then Hunter played it up intelligently. Like, you know, he laid on the ground. Ah, <laughs> they stopped the play, but he wasn't really hurt. Not, not certainly not hurt enough to where he couldn't continue. Evidence mm -hmm. being that he did continue. You say the, the rule needs, um, 
what's the word you used? A, a clarification or update a change. Maybe, maybe I, I would actually, rather than being just black and white, because yeah. I think this is what the problem with the rule as it is currently constructed. It's it's even though Gene and Seth and Jay can disagree on it, it's supposed to be clear. Did this hat look at it? Did you see this? If you saw this, it's a flagrant one, right? Yeah. I would actually like to leave it up to the officials a little bit more. Like, let them talk about it. Let them provide context. You know, Major League Baseball does this. I was trying earlier to think of uh, something from another sport that is, and it might be apples to oranges, but I think you'll get the point. In Major League Baseball, do you realize you can hit a batter in the head with a fastball 97 miles per hour and be punished in no way whatsoever? Yeah. They just let you throw the next pitch. They'll take that guy to the hospital and you throw the next pitch. On the other hand, you can also throw a fastball three feet over somebody's head, mm -hmm. it doesn't even hit them, and they'll throw you out of the game. Mm -hmm. It's all left up to the ump. It's at his discretion. All right, this is just a ball that got away from this guy. It meant nothing. It's just a bad pitch. He's going to stay in the game. All right, this guy just homered off this guy two innings ago. Now he's back up, and first pitch, he threw it over his head. You got to go. Noah Syndergaard got thrown out of a World uh, NLCS game. 2015 for the Mets didn't hit anybody just threw a ball over somebody's head that connected some stuff from a previous game. And the ump said, you can't do that. You're gone. I didn't hit anybody. Doesn't matter. You're gone. Cause the umps knew what he was doing. I would like officials to have a little more leeway here to be able to huddle, look at it and go, okay, the way that rule used to be written, this would maybe be a flagrant one, but come on, man, these dudes have been playing for 39 minutes. Why don't we just let them figure this out and not, Maybe not decide the game with this call, but you certainly flip the odds in a dramatic way. Yeah, TCU goes from being up two with the ball in transition to to down two with the ball. You you flip the game. Yeah. You you at least you you took a likely winner and made them a likely loser. You took a likely loser and made them a likely winner. Mm -hmm. I would like officials to be able to provide that context in their huddle and say, guys, we'll talk about this more later but we are not making this call right now because it will be a terrible way to end this game. Yep. I, I agree. And you know, play so many damn games in a year. You're going to have these instances pop up for every now and then uh, of all the times of all the teams. It, it just happened to be Kansas in that building, which just, you know, fuels the fire for opposing fan bases that have been on the wrong end of not the, that exact kind of scenario, but you get the point.